There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. Furnished by the National Association of Broadcasters and this podcast. The dream was to play professionally for the Cosmos in Giant Stadium. The Cosmos country phenomenon of the old North American Soccer League hit Carney hard. There's a festive atmosphere at Giant Stadium as a Soccer Bowl record throng of almost 75,000 turns out to see the Cosmos meet an old nemesis, the Tampa Bay Rowdies. If you take the back roads from Kearney, you're really only 5-10 minutes away from Giant Stadium. Just down the road, I have the mecca of soccer in this country. And so it was a world all-star team coming together and playing in our backyard. How lucky were we? The Cosmos was the dream for us. The Cosmos, to play in Giant Stadium, to play in a a packed stadium, which was essentially our home. That was the dream. We had the best role models you could ask for as street soccer players. And we would all just go back to our playgrounds afterward and we'd pretend we were those guys. So it wasn't uncommon after a Cosmo game, we'd all go back to our local playground and I was Carlos Alberto for the day. Someone was, whoever claimed it first was Pelé, you know, like. That had a massive influence on me as a player because I thought one day I want to do this. I thought personally, you know, why not me next? And I'm sure John thought the same and and Tab and a and hundred other guys that played in Kearney thought the same thing. Why not me next? Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Well, hey there, everybody. How are you? My name is Tim Hanlon, and uh, thank you for finding us uh, in the uh, crazy expanse of podcast land. Uh, you have stumbled into the world and the rabbit hole that we call Good Seats Still Available. Yes, it is our curious little podcast devoted to what used to be in professional sports. I am your humble and congenial host, Tim, Tim Hanlon, that is. I appreciate you finding us and um, welcome to the festivities, of course. First and foremost, we uh, do hope and trust that you are doing your best to stay safe uh, and healthy and uh, listening to all of your local authorities as to what to do and what not to do. And uh, we uh, hope we can, uh, of course, continue uh, to provide a little bit of distraction. Uh, God knows you've got plenty of other things out there to worry about. But uh, for the next hour or so, this will not be one of them because we have a uh, a great show, as we try to do for you each and every week. Uh, we're going to dial it back to soccer, as you heard in that little clip there. And uniquely with our guests this week. Tom McCabe and Kirk Rudell, uh, we're going to be talking about their fine, 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 and then some documentary devoted to what they call Soccer Town USA. And that is Kearney, New Jersey, the great state, the garden state of New Jersey, where yours truly is from, by the way. Not that that matters. Well, it does matter because Kearney uh, is the cradle, if you will, or one of the cradles of American soccer history in this country. There, there are a number of other uh, locations, I think, that could make some claim. We've talked about St. Louis for sure on a couple of previous episodes and then a lot of other hamlets out there, too. But as we'll talk about with Tom and, and Kirk uh, in a few minutes, uh, perhaps no more unique a location uh, than uh, Kearney, New Jersey, as being, frankly, the one of the sort of hubs longstanding from from the earliest days of 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 the soccer ball being kicked around professionally or or even in amateur fashion in organized fashion uh Kearney, new jersey uh, absolutely and as you heard in that clip you heard names uh voices of of three of the protagonists uh in this documentary which goes through the entire rich history uh, of soccer and the town of Kearney, uh and, and traces it almost sort of in parallel to that of, of, of the history of the sport of soccer in the United States, with an exclamation point, uh, with uh, the three protagonists uh, featured very heavily in this film, John Harkes, Tony Miola, and Tab Ramos, arguably three of the, uh, of the favorite sons, I guess, of Carney, 
and their uh, their exploits uh, of their World Cup uh, world, uh, you know, breaking days or record breaking days, certainly for the, this country, the United States World Cup uh, in the 90s and frankly, helping establish what is now 25 years strong, maybe with an asterisk this year for obvious reasons, of Major League Soccer. These are three of the original uh, founders, if you will, on the playing surface uh, of Major League Soccer. And what a story that these three uh, have really kind of emblematically brought to the United States in the sport of soccer. Yeah. And Carney is very much the roots of all of it, and all three of them born and raised in Carney. And it's it's a it's a it's a tremendous conversation. It's a tremendous documentary. It is available now on YouTube for free. Uh, dial it up and watch it and enjoy it as I have a couple of times. Uh, and not only will you enjoy sort of the uh, the longitudinal story of Carney and uh, uh, the sort of the quintessential products of that uh, soccer history, Mr. Uh, Messrs. Harks, Miola, and Ramos, but also, frankly, uh, some of the uh, earlier stars in the old North American soccer league. We get into the Cosmos for sure, because as you well remember, Giant Stadium where the Cosmos played and, and their historic uh, uh, and once in a lifetime uh, kinds of exploits uh, was literally a stone's throw from Carney. And uh, Tony Miola and Tab Ramos and John Harks were mere teenagers or, or and high school soccer players at the time. And, you know, they actually saw the New York Cosmos being almost a, something aspirational that they could do. And boy, did they have the talent. Not a surprise that they would think that they could actually make it to that level. And as a matter of fact, Tab Ramos uh, was even drafted by the Cosmos, albeit uh, in the, uh, the the dying days of the, the Cosmos and the NASL's existence. So, so Tab, well, we got to sort of uh, play some uh, scrimmages and some, uh, you know, some preseason stuff and and all that. The the team and the league kind of just whimpered away just as he was getting ready to kind of make his uh, his mark. But the good thing for all those guys is, yes, while the 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 uh, the disappointment of the uh, of the top tier NASL going away, uh, they stuck with it and uh, through the uh, the dark and lean years uh, and the national team and, and but getting back to the summit with 1990s uh, U.S. national team making it back into the World Cup for you know after decades of uh, being in the darkness and the wilderness and uh, one of the reasons for that World Cup being awarded to the United States the the guarantee that there would be a pro league that would come in its wake. Uh, three uh, guys, no better uh, position than those guys to uh, be the ushers, shall we say, of that new era. But also to the uh, the old NASL was not just the Cosmos and their dreams, but there were also a bunch of Carney natives that were actually plying their trades as one of the as the, some of the few Americans in the NASL. Guys like Dave DiRico and uh, Eddie Austin and Santiago Formoso, a Cosmo key. Uh, the Hartford Bicentennials for uh, as well. Hugh O'Neill, also a Hartford slash Connecticut Bicentennial in the NASL. So we get into all of that stuff, the NASL, the Cosmos, but also the story sort of uh, uh, emphatically uh, uh, expressed uh, in in guys like John Harks and, and Tab Ramos and Tony Miola uh, and, and Kearney, New Jersey, the, uh, the center of it all. Not only those guys, uh, but also sort of the heritage and the history and frankly, uh, a really good example of why soccer uh, is now much more solidly rooted in this country. Uh, and uh, that is the theme uh, and the topic that we get into. And it's fascinating, uh, just as the documentary is, this conversation with Tom McCabe and Kirk Rudell coming up uh, in just a few moments. Uh, you will enjoy it for sure. I, I learned a lot and uh, it is, it's, it's tremendous. And I, I look forward to presenting it to you in just a few moments. Before we get there, uh, I want to say congratulations to one of our contest winners from last week. Uh, our last week's episode, episode 159, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, uh, it was called Chronicling Pro Sports' Major Leagues with Tom Brocato, who was the author of the book, the uh, the essential now reference book called Major Sports Leagues. And we asked two uh, trivia questions, one of which we had a definitive answer to. Uh, and that was our second question. Around what were the uh, uh, give me all the names of the teams of this league in the 1980s called Major League Volleyball and uh, kudos and a hat tip to Aaron Kramer of Hobart, Wisconsin, who uh, a mere four hours after the show was dropped, had the correct answer. And those teams in Major League Volleyball were thus the Chicago Breeze, 
the Los Angeles Starlights, the New York Liberties, the San Jose Gold Diggers, uh, arguably the most uh, 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 famous and successful team, the Minnesota Monarchs of Major League Volleyball, and then one team that literally played in each of the three seasons of Major League Volleyball, but uh, in different cities uh, and uh, in different uh, with different nicknames. Uh, 1987, the Dallas Bells. Uh, in 1988, the Arizona Blaze. And then by 1989, they had migrated to Portland, Oregon, and become the Spikers, the Portland Spikers. So congratulations to our pal Aaron Kramer uh, up in Hobart, Wisconsin, and uh a copy, uh, a brand new and very heavy 520 some odd page copy of Tom Brocato's book, Major Sports Leagues, which is available, by the way, uh, through our website at uh, goodseatstillavailable.com. Just search up the episode with Tom. Uh, you'll find a couple of links to it. There's an Amazon link, but there's also a direct link to our pals at St. Johan Press uh, where you can buy the book directly. And uh, a copy of that book is uh, will be uh, within a matter of uh, days on its way up to beautiful Hobart, Wisconsin. And uh, Aaron Kramer, thank you not only for your contest entry and successful contest entry at that, but also for listening to the show and your very kind words. We appreciate it. And uh, we uh, thank him and you for listening, hopefully this week, too. Uh, and here it comes, our conversation this week. Uh, with Tom McCabe and Kirk Rudell, we're getting into Soccer Town, USA. It's the story of Kearney, New Jersey, and the soccer, uh, just the roots of uh, of it, and the story of American soccer in general. Uh, and here it comes right at you. Please enjoy. Why don't uh, we sort of uh, begin at the beginning? of uh, your respective stories uh, and I guess how you sort of stumbled and or fell in love with the sport of soccer. And then we'll kind of ramble on down to the uh, specifics of this story and how you got there. But but first, a little sort of preface as to, you know, your respective lives generally, aside from this film uh, and how soccer hit your radar and uh, ultimately into this film. I, I grew up in a town in New Jersey, suburb of New York. And I call it an accident of geography because I you know, grew up in a place that was a soccer town. Uh, there was a youth soccer club that had been established in the 70s and into the 80s. And it was uh, so I very much grew up in a soccer environment. And I know that's not typical, uh, but it was all around. I mean, it was uh, the Cosmos country phenomenon. It would go to all the games at Giant Stadium. And this is what I wanted to do, um, play soccer. Uh, you know, which kind of led me, you know, on my educational path. You know, I got to play in college with uh, Kirk uh, for Bob Bradley at Princeton. And then after that, I went into a life of uh, teaching and coaching and started to do some graduate work in history, you know, picking up some graduate degrees along the way. And I started to study the history of the game. And, uh, you know, that led me, you know, to where I am today. I teach the global history of soccer at Rutgers University at Newark, um, uh, started uh, a history project, the long history of soccer in the United States through the lens of Kearney, New Jersey. And well into the research process, I got a kind of fateful call um, about five years ago. And Kiko Doran, a Kearney native, was on the other line. And he said, I hear you're writing a book on soccer in Kearney. I said, yes, yeah, I am. And he goes, well, I want to make a documentary. I said, so do I. And then that started this whole process, which you know, culminated a couple of weeks ago when we um, offered uh, Soccer Town USA uh, to the soccer community on YouTube. And uh, my introduction to the game, my, my accident of geography was being born in Manhattan, where the city game was basketball. And my dad had been a college basketball player, but he had also an appreciation for the game in the house. And I, my first vivid memory was uh, of a World Cup was 1978 because it was in Argentina. It was, it was close enough time zone wise where the games weren't on a huge delay and we could watch them on a black and white TV and watching Argentina and the Netherlands in the final and just appreciating what was going on on the screen. Uh, even though it was harder to find opportunities to play. So I played in school, but there was no club soccer. Uh, we didn't have that that 
that world in the city when I was growing up. So you played soccer in the fall and watched the Cosmos. I, I remember them at Downing Stadium uh, on the other side of the river. And then knowing that Pele and all the best players were were playing in New York just felt like, well, of course, everyone comes to New York. Why shouldn't they be here? And then suddenly it was gone. And I had had no idea what was going on right next to where the Cosmos were playing in Kearney. Even though I grew up just a few miles away, uh, I didn't know what was happening there and uh, and would not have known about it if Tom hadn't called me a few years ago. But I did get to to walk on in college. Tom has been very generous that I played with him. I walked on and was his backup for a couple of years, which was a thrill for me because I had been a good high school player, but had not expected to be able to play at that level in college. And I had a, a good enough team that they were able to throw me on the back of the car and give me a ride and uh, stayed with the game after I graduated started getting into pickup in New York as that scene started to pick up and, and, and grow. And, uh, and now I'm more involved as a, as a club soccer parent in Los Angeles. So how did you guys get uh, connected slash reconnected, I guess, around sort of this project, like sort of what was the, how did the spark sort of happen to say, okay, commonality, similarity, we played together. How does the project of a film like this come about? So I was a little nervous to bring it up, and uh, we were at uh, a reunion at Princeton, which they have, you know, in 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 May each year. And I was pretty sure I was going to see Kirk, and you know, well into the evening, um, I said, "Hey, I, I got something to talk to you about," and I kind of pitched him uh, about this Carney story, and he was like, "Yeah, this is really interesting." We talked, you know, I don't know, half an hour to an hour. And then he's like, I'd love to see it because you know, I had written the first version of the script and I sent it to him. And, and I remember him, you know, saying, oh, you don't need me. This is already written. But, you know, Kirk is, is quite modest as well. I mean, he's written in uh, New York and uh, L.A. for you know over 20 years. Spin City, Will and Grace, American Dad, you know, specialty in particular in, in sitcoms. And he had, you know, I, I, he was the closest guy I, I knew, you know, that was a writer, you know, for television, for documentary. And, and I knew he was, you know, passionate about the game. So it, it was the case of of calling a buddy and saying, you know, do you want to do this together? Can you help me? Well, I think that's what Tom had been working on a book on this. And so he had been pursuing it in a scholarly way. He had been pursuing it as a, as an historian. And when Kiko called Tom and said, do you want to make a movie? Suddenly Tom had to look at it through literally and figuratively a different lens. And I was the closest thing he knew to a documentary filmmaker, even though I had, I'd worked in TV and movies. I had not actually, I had, I had interned for a documentary company uh, in college, but had never made a documentary myself. So he, but yeah, it was, it was calling out of the blue kind of and saying, uh, do you want to talk about kind of a weird idea that I have? And for me, it was a chance to reconnect with a friend. It was a chance to do something about soccer, which I love. And, and so for me, it was a chance to approach it, not from the historian side, which Tom had been, but from a storytelling side. And so that then became the project was knitting together Tom's, the history that he had, the, the archives that he had dug through, all the research he'd done, as well as his own very personal connection to, to New Jersey soccer, and knitting that to, uh, to my love of, uh, of, of an arc, of, of a character's journey, of a friendship story, of an immigrant story, all the stuff that we tried to sort of dig out in the, in the movie. So, so how does Carney come about? Because ironically, neither of you are Carney natives right and if if i if i sort of have the story correct in your let's call it formative soccer uh years uh, learning cosmos games playing etc yeah you were i guess generally or or specifically unaware of either carney or certainly its importance uh in in the fabric of american soccer history writ large uh, how does the how does carney come about was it because of this specific project, uh, Tom, or, and, or if so, why did you circle around Carney for that, that then germinated into the movie idea? 
I was charmed by Carney probably as a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, when I first went into the town to play a youth soccer game. And I want to say I was nine or 10 pretty early on. I'm in one goal, goalkeeper, as is Kirk, right? We're all a member of that union there. And I'm looking across this dusty, dirty field, and Tony Miola is in the opposite goal. Uh, we were both, you know, the same birth year. So I, I grew up playing regularly against Carney, home and away, indoor, outdoor, and they were a big rival. So this was a magical, mysterious place. I remember driving in there, you know, in my dad's VW rabbit, just kind of looking out the window, right? The kids were wearing sambas and you would see a kid carrying a soccer ball. You'd look at the playgrounds uh, next to the schools, the blacktop, and they had soccer lines and goals there. It was like, who does this? Um, and I really think for me, that's the beginning of this journey. And then, you know, I had played for the Scots Americans a little bit right at the end of college and, and, you know, in, in men's soccer, uh, and got to meet some of the characters, if you will, that, that are in the film and they're just, you know, in Carney in general. And it was probably just always there. And then as I got involved, you know, in the scholarship, I was like, this is the story I, I need to tell. This is, I was meant to do this. And, and that's, and to your, to your larger question there too, I think if I had gone to Carney and said, I'd like to tell the story about your town, uh, we would not have ended up with anything close to the movie that we have, but Tom had enough credibility as a New Jersey soccer kid uh, that there was a, a trust that he was going to do right by the story. He had, he already had a foot in the door there. And so I think if I'd come in as the, the New York guy who played a little bit, um, I would not have had as much access or as much, the doors would not have opened for me the way they opened uh, for Tom. See, this this is interesting because, you know, on a personal level, this, and we've talked about this sort of in preparation here, uh, this actually is quite parallel, and we may be of similar ages, to sort of my sort of upbringing as well, growing up in, in uh, northern Bergen County, playing soccer uh, occasionally against this Carney thing or one of their various teams through high school as well. I, I, a vague recollection, perhaps, of playing against one of the three major components and stars, if you will, of this film, either Messrs. Harks, Miola, or Tab Ramos. Vague recollections. Just uh, at the end of the day, everybody we seem to play at Carney was, you know, light years ahead of, of where we were anyway. So yeah, it, it, I could have gotten names and people mixed up. But um, the one common thread, though, and again, I, I'm injecting my own personal thing here, but maybe I can use this as a jumping off point into the narrative of the story and the film is this, uh, I, let's call it this Cosmos soccer thing, because in many respects, and I don't want to give this away, but it's almost the, the Cosmos sheen uh, that year, that late 70s, early 80s, uh, for lack of a better word, phenomenon. Uh, and we've explored a little bit of this. And arguably, it's been the, re the reason why I even got into this silly podcast three plus years ago was sort of that perverse fascination of all the logos and teams and this NASL thing and whatever. But it, it, that was a, uh, a an electric time, especially for, I'm guessing, players like you, myself, who had the luxury, and I would argue in the 70s, in northern New Jersey, metropolitan New York, even across the country, right? It was still relatively rare to be a youth soccer player with depth of programs and coaches, and uh, it was not nearly the phenomenon it is today, and we were arguably lucky and then having this pro thing of gargantuan proportion literally in our respective backyards, I think it's interesting because it's almost like the inflection point of this movie. There's sort of like the before Cosmos stuff, and then there's the after. I, I know that's sort of not how you set up the narrative, but but maybe you could describe a little bit, for especially for our non-native New Yorkers, this sort of Cosmos phenomenon and how impressionable, I guess, it could have been for people like us, and maybe sort of it's... Uh, setting of table, I guess, for maybe at least some background for this story that we'll get a little bit deeper into in a second. Sure. I'll take the well, Jersey side and um, sure. we, we might be um, equidistant, Kirk and I, from Kearney, right? He might be the same amount east that I grew up uh, on the west side of Kearney. And Giant Stadium was right there. 
and you begged your parents to get there early because you knew you could go to you know a certain location in the parking lot where your club teammates would be. You'd play a little pickup. You'd eat some food. And, you know, then you get into the stadium, you know, watch a little of the warmups. I was, you know, a big fan of Jack Brand and I would be behind the goal watching him unbeknownst to me, Sal Rosamilia and Tony Miola, who were also, you know, in the stands or doing the same thing. And then I was lucky enough. Um, my dad bought tickets through his uh, business. So we were in the mezzanine. And I didn't know it at the time, but in would roll Mick Jagger. I saw Muhammad Ali there. I saw Henry Kissinger there. Oh, that's my father. Cause everybody's kind of standing up and, and getting a look. So it was definitely a place to be, you know, the, the stars uh, from various lives and worlds would, would, would be there. Uh, and then after the game, um, as we'd walk the, down the spiral, you know, uh, exits, uh, we would get, into the stadium club, you know, with those season tickets. And then you'd get the, the kind of the menu and, and then you go up to Franz Beckenbauer and get his autograph or, you know, I'd get always get the goalkeeper. Hubert Berkemeyer was one of my heroes. So it was just like, I can't believe, you know, I'm here, but, but it also seemed pretty normal. Like doesn't every kid have this, you know, in their own backyard. And I think, you know, for me in, in, in my school growing up, my varsity soccer coach was the JV basketball coach who was biding his time to get, he was a great basketball player and a great basketball coach, but the varsity coach wasn't going anywhere for a few years. And this guy had to pick up another sport. So he got varsity soccer and, you know, bought a bunch of books and tried to learn some drills and the, the level of coaching, even though we had a good high school team was not what Tom would have grown up with across the river, but, even with what was a a somewhat primitive soccer environment, the Cosmos made it all feel legit if you liked the game because these were some of the biggest stars in the world playing right there. You could go see them. And so it it somehow made the dream legitimate. It made the, the love of the sport legitimate because, look, there's 60,000 people over in Giant Stadium and Pelé is there. So... Uh, so even in an environment that was not as soccer mad as New Jersey, it was it was OK to like soccer because the Cosmos were soccer and the Cosmos were cool. So I think that absolutely in the area we grew up, they were uh, a magnet for the game and they legitimized the game. And I think that's jumping into the movie a little bit. I think one of the the emotionally heartbreaking parts for me of the movie, which is generally uplifting, but has a couple moments that, that get serious. And I think one of the ones that we wanted to really, uh, Charlie Stilitano talking about the NASL folding, the cosmos going away and all of us being left with. So I guess our game isn't accepted here. I guess it's not cool. I guess there is nothing for us to grab onto and maybe we are outsiders uh, for loving this thing. We had um, in our uh, episode number was 64, uh, Michael Agovino, uh, who wrote a great book called The Soccer Diaries. Uh, uh, it's basically sort of an exploration of, of a similar New York native sort of, uh, I guess, love affair with the sport of soccer, uh, including the sort of the apex and then the denouement and then the sort of abandonment, if you will, that you're describing it. And I think to even put a finer point on it, and it opens up the uh, the door here for for the the broader story of the, of the film, you hear and see Tony Miola and, and Tab Ramos and and John Harks and, and some of the other folks around, basically talking uh, with giddy enthusiasm about how, you know, this aspirational blessing, if you will, literally within the shadow of Carney, uh, of pro soccer of the highest level, not just in the country. And the curiosity of that, but but the, we soon found out years later it was you know as the documentary film was titled Once in a Lifetime it was it was it was a worldwide you know center of of talent and and stars and and um, and being if you will um, and then to have that all essentially kind of evaporate right I think anybody you, yours truly uh, are are the both of you anybody else who sort of became transfixed especially as a youth playing the game, 
maybe not having the skill, at least I'll speak for myself, to get to that, you know, proverbial next level. But at least it, to your point, it made it legit and then some. And then to have it basically go away, it's kind of like, ah, was this a false dream? Were we silly and, and just misguided to even think that this would be something worthwhile over the longer term? And I, that comes out very clearly in the three protagonists, really, of this film who almost used it as, I guess, I don't know, a deepening of resolve to ultimately get where they wound up, which is at the highest level of soccer in this country, out of the ruins of that sort of collapse of professional soccer, at least at the NASL level. The historian in me wants to go back to a completely different century when pro soccer first came to the United States, 1894. So very early professional league, the baseball club owners wanted to put a, a sport uh, in their uh, ballparks in the winter. So they formed uh, professional teams. There was one in Boston. There was one in Brooklyn. Uh, there was one in Baltimore. Uh, there was one in Washington, D.C. And the league has great promise. Uh, because there's this, you know, kind of lots of immigrants who have come here who have been playing in these leagues now can make this jump, you know, to full professional. And it lasts 17 days. And then pro soccer is dead in this country until 1921. Post-World War One, the American Soccer League, uh, a lot of the big teams like Bethlehem Steel, uh, J.P. Coates, uh, are sponsored by corporations. So they're throwing their weight behind it. And we get world stars from Scotland, from England, uh, making that uh, kind of transfer, if you will, that transatlantic uh, journey uh, to the United States to play. They would work at the corporation and then get uh, paid uh, to play soccer. So they can make more money here than they could in Europe. Uh, and then, you know, post-1966 World Cup, which was broadcast, you know, around the world, there are sports people and business people in the United States who think they can make money. Uh, and they start the NASL in the late 60s uh, and early 70s. And then the marker that we talked about already, Pele shows up in 1975, and he's here to convert um, the non-believers, if you will. Um, he is uh, on a mission, uh, you know, to spread the gospel of uh, of soccer to uh, you know the United States of America, that last frontier, and then that league starts. Um, and you know, as we you know talk about in the film, uh, it, it closes down in 1985. And that story is beautifully told through the Cosmos perspective, uh, through once in a lifetime. And I was on a Zoom call this morning with Laurent Dubois' uh, Politics of Soccer course at Duke University. They had studied the NASL. They had watched that documentary, which I love. And one of the students observed, you know, the film Soccer Town USA is almost a sequel to Once in a Lifetime. And uh, I nodded my head in agreement, right? You know, we're kind of picking up the story, you know, after the NASL collapses with the dream, you know, having died and, and what's next. And, you know, part of the genesis, you know, as we were even as we were building the documentary, what was happening at the same time was that our old college coach was named as the head coach of the new MLS franchise in Los Angeles. And uh, we were seeing the growth of MLS expansion teams, crowded stadiums, fan culture. And one of the things that Tom and I would talk about in putting this together was uh, you know, what does MLS look like today without these three guys and without Carney in that post NASL sort of in those ashes, if the national team doesn't pick it up, maybe there is no MLS or maybe it's delayed another 10 years. And so how much is it built now? And, and what we realize is for a lot of fans today, they may know Landon Donovan's generation, Clint Dempsey's generation, Tim Howard, but very few of them are aware of that generation before that really laid a foundation that everything now is built on. So overlay then Carney atop that uh, thumbnail history, right? Because in many respects, the the cradle of Kearney, right? Uh, and, and there are probably some other pockets, too. We've explored St. Louis on a previous episode and and some other other areas, largely ethnic, uh, some kind of 
uh, connection to the old world and, and the importation of the game. But but frankly, very few of them, right? And so aside from maybe St. Louis, Carney is very much an outlier. Maybe you can just sort of uh, help help the audience better understand uh, and hopefully get excited about watching the film, uh, of course. Uh, it, the sort of the role of Carney, if you will, against that backdrop of, uh, for lack of a better description, starting and stopping, I guess, with this flirtation of with pro, the pro version of the game in this country. While the game has had some traumatic events uh, and some triumphs in this country, you know, I think the role of Carney, it's just always been there. Uh, it, it's been a constant. And when you look at Carney, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, well into the 20th century, it's predominantly Scottish um, and Irish working class, you know, driven by the thread industry. And soccer was part of this cultural baggage that came with them. But then when you look just after this story kind of transpires, after, you know, John and Tony and Tab are out of high school, new people start to move into Kearney, the Portuguese at first. Uh, and then, you know, the predominant immigrant group right now is from Peru uh, and other South American countries. So a uh, Immigration constantly renews America. Immigration constantly renews American soccer. And Carney is proof of that. And the one thing that it has been there, the thread, pun intended, uh, from when those textile mills first show up in the 1860s, 1870s, all the way through, is soccer. So it, it's in the, in the um, fabric uh, uh, of the sport in this country. And yet, and it's it's something that mystifies me is that even though it has always been, it's always been in Carney, and that's thing you can you can track it almost to the day. The Scots in the in the in the in the British colonialism and expansion, and the English, yeah, that that the Scots brought it to Carney, and then they brought it to Brazil. Like you can you can they know the steamship and the guy that walked off with the ball in Brazil and said, OK, here's a ball. I'm going to teach you guys this game. So it's always been in Kearney and every generation of immigrants that has come through New York and ended up in New Jersey to to try to make a living and sort of piled in and, and built more layers to that community. The, the Italians or, you know, by, by Tab's time, the Uruguayan, South Americans, Germans, every generation that would come, soccer was there. So for as long as these leagues were rising and falling, for as long as soccer was trying to get a foothold in the United States, it was being played in Kearney the whole way through. Uh, and it is also still mystifying to me that it was the immigrant game throughout even though it had been here for so long. Whereas for baseball, Joe DiMaggio became the Yankee Clipper in Mr. America. He's an Italian American guy uh, who was by, by playing baseball, he was, you know, embraced by, uh, you know, and, and became a, a media star, but a, uh, you know, uh, the same version playing soccer was, was an outsider. But then Yogi Berra grew up in St. Louis playing both baseball and soccer, you know, so it kind of depends, you know, where, where, where you grow up, right? It's that accident right. geography that we, we started the show with. Yeah, and that geography is, is interesting. And I, just, I guess I'm really especially curious about, say, a Kearney or a St. Louis, for that matter, <clears throat> about, you know, what is it in the soil and, the, you know, the, the unique uh, essence of the valley. Uh, I'm, I'm straining an analogy, like for grapes or whatever. But why, why the grapes? I guess of soccer, if you could strain it further. Uh, uh, you know, there. Ver I mean, Carney certainly not the only ethnic enclave, so to speak, uh, or uh, entity or area in the country or the Northeast, for that matter, or even in the New York metropolitan area, for that matter. Uh, that was, you know, uh, had soccer interested and or heritaged. Uh, players or aficionados, but it seems like Carney sort of had that sort of extra special something. M maybe I, I don't know. Maybe it's it was just longevity or commitment, or maybe there was something in the Scottish blood uh, that sort of endured and or uh, passed along the generations. I, what do you think was that sort of special extra something? Maybe that that made that area so I guess uh, constant 
uh, through all that, say, relative to, to, to other areas around the country? Well, I'll borrow a line from Jim Harks, John Harks' father. He's like, must be something in the water, right? So New Jersey gets a bad rap for uh, you know, its water quality or toxic turf or uh, pollution. So, so there might have been you know, something in the water. But, but I think those other things that you touch on, right, it is continual immigration uh, and renewal and, and the institutions, right? So immigrants, when they come uh, here and other places, they, they bring their traditions, their rituals, their institutions, their churches, their social clubs, their cuisine, their sports. Uh, and, you know, that that is, you know, happened across time. And, and I, I think it's a mistake to also, you know, say that that it was, you know, just Carney or St. Louis. I mean, there's evidence uh, wherever you go, you know, in particular, the Scottish and the English brought the game with them. So in the late 1800s, early 1900s, whether it's San Francisco, Hawaii, um, you know, often places with ports, um, with, you know, shipping activity, the, the Brits would have been there and they would have gotten off the boat with a soccer ball and started playing. And if there was enough of them, they formed teams. Uh, if there were enough teams, they'd form a league. Uh, so, so there's a lot of evidence, you know, of this, but, but they don't have the staying power that, that, that Corny has. Um, and, and that is probably what makes it unique, you know, over 150 years uh, of soccer playing tradition. And just from, from my participation in, in the dock and spending some time in Kearney and going to the Scots club, it felt like that generational thing was super important there. That family thing. It's they, all the guys would talk about going into the Scots club and the dads are smoking and drinking at the bar and the kids come in after a game and it becomes, how'd you play today? You play as well as your old man, your older brother. Did you live up to where your grandfather played? And so there was, it, it was like the, uh, uh, it was like an apprenticeship that every kid there had and the understanding that they were going to, they were going to do what the generations before them had done. And then I, I'm, again, I'll, I'll defer to the historian, but did the, and I'm guessing the mills also kept it alive, at least for the first 50, 60 years of it. Yeah, they corporately sponsored, you know, the, the teams and, and put resources and money, um, you know, behind it. Okay, so like it the so, roots. Uh, I think like the roots were well watered by the corporations, and then and then I think it became very generational. Right, and and this generational story is very interesting. So Kirk and I are saying, you know, we we were sons of athletes, but not soccer players. Uh, we, we play. We have this you know cosmos phenomenon to to tap in, and our children really had no choice. Not to you know to, they had to play soccer, right? I I remember sending my son to middle school baseball, like little league was not even an option. I had played little league, you know, I was, I enjoyed it, you know, all that, but I was not rushing him, you know, to sign up for little league baseball. And I send him to a middle school baseball tryout with um, a right-handed mitt. He's left-handed. So he literally had to go to the tryout, you know, just (laughs) ill-equipped, um, and you know, he, he went through the, the, the whole season, not getting a hint, a hit. And, and I say to him, you don't want to go through the whole season and not get a hit. I think it was like six games, you know, we're not baseball really at all. So the last time, you know, and I, I'm encouraging him to swing for the fences and, and, the, and the last time, um, he's up, he lays out a bunt and he races to first play uh, base and, and he stands there and he looks over me at winks and he's in middle school. I thought that was a great sporting moment, you know, from, but he never played baseball. He played a little middle school baseball. And, and I think that's maybe something different about, you know, our children is it's soccer first. It's not like, Oh, I'm going to stumble on soccer. No, no, no. That's the, the sport of choice. And cause it was your parents sport. And that's why I'm really hopeful for, for the future of the game here. Just that alone. Yeah. I think we, you know, as parents too, I, we, you know, we take it for granted, right. That uh, they're, or the kids take it for granted, like this was sort of always the case, right? And 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 we're, I think, living, breathing examples of of you know we were arguably more fortunate even than most as the sport was sort of just spreading out, you know, in the '60s and the '70s from its its largely ethnic, you know, roots and 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 uh, and, and origins. But let me let me zoom up to maybe the early to beginning of mid '70s because as the stories of uh, of 
John Harks, Tony Miola, Tab Ramos comes to sort of uh, maturity, shall we say, in the late 70s, early 80s, and then and, and onward. Uh, they're actually immediately influenced by not only the Cosmos, but basically uh, a number of their, if you will, hometown heroes playing in this uh, now, after being on death's doorstep, frankly, uh, the fledgling North American Soccer League, Cosmos included, but, but you know, generally. Uh, maybe a little bit of, and we sort of joked about this uh, yesterday in preparation for our, our conversation, uh, you know, I, I think one of the interesting and unsung heroes of this film is the aforementioned uh, Santiago Formosa, right? Not only playing for the Cosmos, but he's one of a number of players coming out of the Carney slash Harrison cradle that was uh, kind of uh, knocking down some doors and making, I think, the ability to play professional soccer in the United States actually tangible for some of these kids named Harks, Mule, and Ramos. Absolutely. I mean, there were four locals who made it in, in the North American Soccer League. Yui O'Neill and Santiago Formosa grew up across the street from one another on Highland Avenue in Kearney, and they both played for the Bicentennials. Santi, as you mentioned, goes to the Cosmos. Yui goes to the Memphis Rogues. There's Davy DeRico, who played for uh, Seattle Sounders. Last time I heard, they're still around. He was a captain of the U.S. national team from Harrison. And then, you know, Carney's Eddie Austin, uh, an immigrant uh, from Scotland, uh, who also ends up uh, playing in the league. So, so that was very tangible, very real. Not only did uh, the trio, John, Tony, and Tab, you know, see Beckenbauer and Carlos Alberto and Pele, they saw four locals uh, make it. Uh, and that was a real source of inspiration. As I recall, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't Santiago was a, he was a wing for the Bicentennials, right? He was a forward. And then yeah, the he was Cosmos an attacking asked player. him. Yeah. And then, but then when, he, but then when the Cosmos who were loaded were, were checking him out, I, well, you can tell the story better, but I, I love the story about, about Santiago. Yeah. I mean, the, the coach at the time, Eddie Fermani, who ended up coaching uh, very briefly in major league soccer for the Metro stars uh, was um, asking Santi, can you play outside back? And Santi was like, absolutely. And, you know, he looked at us in the interview and he goes, I had never played outside back in my life. I was always a winger or a forward. Uh, but to, to be in that, you know, Galacticos, if you will, um, in the galaxy of stars for the cosmos, he was going to play any position. And, and that was really the fate of American players, right? They had to have two American players uh, on the field. Um, in the roster uh, at all times. And it was usually a goalkeeper and a defender. So there weren't very many uh, attacking players um, or spots for those types of players. So it, it was rare, um, you know, to be an attacking midfielder or a winger or a forward. Uh, so it was extra special when you could do that. But to crack that lineup, if, if asked if he could defend, Santi was saying, absolutely, it's my favorite thing in the world. Put me in. Well, you know, as you as you talk to these guys who sort of cracked the code, I guess, on the NASL, you know, sort of the first sort of wave, I guess. Did you ever, as part of the interview process, did you get the sense that they were, I don't know, I, did they kind of pinch themselves? I mean, because they're really, you know, truly pioneers even before the big three we're going to talk about in a minute, in that they kind of proved that it was possible. And to your point, I mean, you know, maybe there's a bit of, of aid, I guess, in the fact that there has to be sort of the mandatory two or then ultimately three North Americans on the field. But still, it's quite an accomplishment, right? Because as as you uh, voiced it in the film, uh, Kirk, it, this was, you know, derided some in some circles as the non-American soccer league uh, because of that. Well, oh, that's it's absolutely to, to get to as small as the U.S. soccer pyramid was at the time it was still an accomplishment to get to the top. And, and I think that, you know, Tom did all those interviews uh, with those guys, but I think that, that they knew that they were part of something special and, and that it was a, uh, a, a unique privilege they were able to have at the time they were coming up to be playing with and against Pele. Like, most people in the world didn't get that. Uh, and so I think it's fair to say that it was, Again, they, there were there were fewer people playing than there than there are now, but it was still an achievement to get on that field. 
All right. So then let's let me segue then into into the shall we say the exclamation point uh, of this story. Right. Um, Three guys. Right. uh, Who ultimately become U.S. national team and then some superstars. I I, I don't think that's a uh, I don't think it's being charitable in the least. Uh, Guys like Tab Ramos and, and John Harks and Tony Miola. Right. So these are you know, these are these are kids, if you will, who not only grew up in the the cradle of soccer civilization, right, in, in the Carney realm of fertility, shall we say. Um, they're experiencing the sort of acceleration and uh, gelling of, a, of a, some kind of pro culture in this country around this sport. And then, if you will, have it if you, uh, kind of removed from them through no fault of their own. What is it about these three guys that that makes them individually and collectively so unique and i guess with enough fortitude to kind of not get bummed out by the fact that there's more stuff ahead for them but they just don't know how and in what form it is on some semblance of a professional career because these are all standout players as they're going through the carney system the carney high school games and championships and all that kind of stuff all that culture all that tradition, I would think mere, lesser mortals, right, would just kind of hang it up after that and say, you know, that it's been fun. We were good. We were damn good. But yeah, I guess we got to get on with our lives now. And, you know, we can still play the pickup thing over time. But they didn't do that. They kept going and, and w- with not a lot to go on and go for in this country. What is it about that? interviewing the three of them, they all look back and say how fortunate they were to grow up where they did and how fortunate they were to be part of the youth national team programs, because that's really what saved their dream, right? When the NASL died and went away, they were already involved in the youth national team programs. And it became pretty apparent pretty quick that now the next project for the United States is to qualify for the 1990 World Cup. Uh, so Tab got there first, and then John and, and Tony is two years you know, younger. Um, there is actually a great story that Tony tells. You know, They're playing a giant stadium in the Marlboro Cup. And goalkeeper gets hurt. Another keeper couldn't make it, I think, for family reasons. So they're short a goalkeeper and they need a backup. And Tony gets the call because he's just across the meadows in uh, Kearney. Uh, he goes and, and, and gets a, a pair of new gloves at uh, uh, Charlie McEwen, uh, who's one of the soccer dads who ran a soccer shop on Kearney Ave and gets to the hotel uh, checks in and the goalkeeper gets hurt, Jeff Duback. Um, and he goes in and the first thing he does is he has to try to sell, uh, save a penalty kick. He doesn't, but he plays well. And then that's kind of his entry in. So now they're all three of them are in. Um, Tony goes back to college. The other guys are involved in, in World Cup qualifying. And then Tony kind of gets that call for that last string of games. So they're all together. So it's it's really the national team that kept their hope alive and, and and what a project that was right because in they had not qualified the u.s had not qualified since 1950 uh, some close calls uh, and you would have expected you know perhaps that the u.s could have qualified with these young americans you know being you know brought up in, in you know the the nasl right in 1982 or 1986 canada qualifies uh, but the u.s can't so with these college kids with these youngsters and a couple holdovers They make it to Trinidad in November of 1989, which I would argue is the most important day in um, the men's national team history and perhaps, you know, American soccer history. Right. Because they, you know, score uh, with that Calajiri, you know, shot heard around the world or at least up and down Carney Ave. And uh, they qualify for the 1990 World Cup and they take this group of underdogs to Italy, which just sets up everything else. I, I believe when Tony checked into that hotel by the Meadowlands, the uh, woman who was working behind the desk was someone he knew from Carney who gave him uh, like a deal on the room because the team hadn't even been able to set up uh, like a reservation for him in advance or something like that. So it really was 
it really was the town of Kearney coming together at a key moment for U.S. soccer. But another thing about that youth national team is there were other guys, even in the movie, who were part of that youth national team setup who were invited to those camps. And you're right. There was something extraordinary about these three guys to to not just go to the camps, but to thrive and to will themselves to make the senior team. And some of those other guys in the film who grew up with them, who played with them today would be playing MLS. They would have a professional career waiting for them. And at the time, they just weren't quite good enough to make the senior national team the way these three guys did. And so they fell away. Um, So there was talent, drive, whatever else. These three were just a little notch above everybody else. I think it's also interesting and and, and, and doubly so in that, um, you know, it's not only uh, their abilities and their uh, they're basically uh, leading and taking the U.S. national uh, men's team uh, through what ultimately became a triumphant for the sport in this country, 1994 World Cup, right? And obviously part of the awarding of that tournament, right, was the expectation by FIFA that a professional league would get set up. I mean, you know, in, in some respects, you see this almost as sort of, it's sort of the, the ultimate sort of icing on the cake because here are three players that, in essence, become uh, the foundational ambassadors, if you will, uh, for this brand new fledgling league. And and perhaps capped off uh, with the sort of uh, proverbial Marciano cherry on top, uh, with the story of Tab Ramos, because here's a guy who ostensibly, not unlike, a, a, say, Frank Klopas uh, here in Chicago, you know, had sort of that just a, a bit of a sip of the wine, if you will, at the in the dying days of the NASL by getting a, a look and or, I guess, being drafted by the New York Cosmos at the time, all that sort of dissipating and going away. And who becomes the first official, I think, signee of this Major League Soccer thing, but but Tab Ramos. I mean, it, that is almost quintessentially emblematic, I guess, of, I, I guess, the, the threading of the needle from, you know, the beginning of, of the entry into the into the cloth and, and it's sort of its ex- exit back out of it, right? It's it, it really creates a complete thematic to, you know, the uh, best of times, uh, the worst of times, and then the sort of... Uh, you know, best of times yet again, and 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 down the road in the future, I'm I'm bungling the uh, the metaphor, but it seems to me like these guys, in many respects, not just the Carney story, but also the, these guys are fundamental and elemental to the the founding and the initial, you know, uh, seeding, if you will, of this. 25 years strong with an asterisk this year, of course, Major League Soccer. Right, without these guys. And and the Carney roots that got them to where they ultimately got successful and and were to to get going in this, you could make the argument on some level that you know Major League Soccer on uh, in some respects might not have really kind of happened the way it did. We interviewed Sunil Gulati and were at his office in the economics department at Columbia University. And he outlined just what you were saying, right? How important these three guys were and their teammates to set up everything that came after, right? In in the wake of uh, the collapse of um, the league. But you, you have to remember the 1984 Olympics were uh, the soccer tournament was extremely successful. So that was in the back of people's minds. And then in 1988, the United States gets awarded uh, the World Cup. There was some thought, let's transfer it from Mexico to the United States in 1986 after the you know earthquake, massive earthquake in in Mexico. Um, but they get the uh, you know bid and win the bid in '88. They have to qualify in '90. They go to Italy as underdogs. You know, I think the highlight there was kind of the resilience in the one nothing loss to to Italy, proving that they you know belonged. Uh, and then that sets up. 
um, 94. Um, and then in the wake of that, Tab, you know, has that horrific elbow uh, from Leonardo. He is, you know, kind of on the shelf for a bit, you know, recovering, convalescing, and he can't find his 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 place back in the, the, the team at Real Betis. He's been promoted to La Liga. So he has this fateful call with Sunil Galati, and Sunil's like, Tab, why don't you come back? I think it's time. And they figure out how to sign him, being the first player signed, loan him. Uh, to him, um, you know, Tigres in Mexico, uh, and, and then he comes back to be this, you know, attacking player, this Latin player, this local player, this national team star, um, unfinished business at, at Giant Stadium, as Tab says, uh, to, to play there for the Metro Stars. And I think if Tab doesn't get hurt, then there's no telling where his career goes in Europe and how long he plays in Spain and what that turns into. But when he decided to come back, it seemed that, that all three of those guys were very aware of the, the burden and responsibility they had uh, as ambassadors of the game, not just players. And they embraced it. And that was something that was very striking too, that extra pressure to not just come and try to compete at a high level, but to try to sell a game and a league to a country that loved it for a couple of weeks in 94, but no one was convinced that a professional league was going to stick again. Um, And so it was, it was almost like they had been something in the water. They had been bred their entire lives to, uh, to have that responsibility. So uh, as we sort of round the corner here, I mean, uh, it's um, as I've, sort of engaged in the exploration process of this podcast over the last three plus years. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, often reminded of how old I am getting. And I guess by extension, you guys too, because we're around the same age. We talk about say major league soccer and you know, there's, there's a generation of kids and, and, and fans who don't even sort of recognize some of the team names, frankly, even being born from the old NASL or born or carried over from, let alone, you know, some of the foundational starting points and elements of, of the league back 25 years ago, right? It seems like for us, probably almost like yesterday and, and relatively uh, memorable and tangible. But, you know, there, there are kids today who are playing that that have really no recollection of that, nor, frankly, any of the, the history, writ small or writ large, that we've been talking about for the last hour or so. But, it, it, but it, you know, to me, and I think as to you guys too, uh, it's important to sort of recognize how this stuff that we enjoy today, 30 teams, if you will, knock on wood, hopefully, uh, in, a, in Major League Soccer and a robust USL underneath it. And, and we can argue about the imperfections of it and the na- men's national team and all that stuff. But look, I, these are higher level arguments now than they ever were 25, 30 plus years ago, right? And there are, you know, I... I throw the term somewhat loose out loosely on this, this show, the pioneers, right? Well, these are three guys who are, you know, whether they agree or not, I, I'm sure in some level they should, they are pioneers, right? They are the gateway and the, the latch, I guess, into this current professional and fairly robust at that era of the game in this country. And it, it, you can't undersell their, uh, their contributions to that, you know, enough. I mean, I, or you can't do that, right? You, they are, foundational to all of it. And um, I guess the question I would sort of wrap up with you guys is what in that process did you learn about them uh, specifically, but maybe sort of the story and the carny roots and all of that generally, that maybe you thought you knew going into this process, intelligent and and schooled and passionate about the sport as you have been over your, your lives, um, that maybe was sort of surprising or unexpected or or did it kind of play out the way you thought it was and just all it did was underline and justify uh the pursuit of the project in the first place i think john tony and tab you know wear that label proudly right they see themselves as pioneers and we were on a group email um you know the lean team that you know made soccer town usa kiko doran that we've mentioned chris Gehring, another carney native rob penzel um, and Kirk and I, and, and the trio was on there and, 
and Tab responded. It was an honor to be part of this project. You know, uh, we still have work to do. Let's make a Soccer Town USA 2.2, 2.0, or part two. Uh, so there, there's this sense that there's still more to do. This second act, and and Tab is now the coach uh, in, in Houston. Uh, John is the coach and sporting director in a lower league team in Greenville, South Carolina. Tony's, you know, kind of pulling his weight, you know, in terms of the announcing and promoting the game that way. So they're all still involved in, and still have more to give. Yes. And quick note before Kirk, you, you, you weigh in, uh, Tony will be, yeah, no, go ahead. he's, uh, he's going to be the uh, color commentator for Chicago fire games here in town. So we're excited about that at least. Right, that's fantastic. Well, I will say just cause Tom is, is uh, maybe being modest about it, but I will say that just in, in for some context of the span of time we're talking about and 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 the the journey that we've seen the game go through tab and tony and john when they were starting out they were getting five dollar per diems on the national team they were you know at the very the the very beginnings of mls as it was picking itself up by its bootstraps and now years later tom's son the terrible little leaguer is an mls player uh, for FC Cincinnati and uh, is is part of the generation that grew up with uh, a healthy, vibrant league to to shoot for. And uh, and he's one of the guys that made it. And so now when the collective bargaining agreement is over, how many charter flights uh, these teams can get, that is, as you say, that's a, that's a higher class fight than what John Tab and Tony and the the pioneers had to go through. And so I think that, you know, in Tom's personal history, as well as his scholarly history, he's seen the growth of this league and what it's meant. Um, but I think for me, what was interesting was how, uh, how universal so much of it was in, in digging in and talking to the people in this town even now, John Tab and Tony, they'll talk about, you know, watching kids play uh, and, 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 you know, kids club teams. And um, the, when we would interview the, the dads who, who helped get the Thistle FC club off the ground and rounding the kids up on the weekend and throwing them in the station wagon and driving to go play a game and you know, getting McDonald's afterwards or bringing them back to the Scots club. There were certain rhythms of that, that, uh, that I go through with my daughter out here and her club team. And I think that there's something, uh, there's a, uh, a great continuity that I felt that I didn't grow up in Kearney. I didn't have that world, but there's something, there was something so sort of pure about the family experience and the friend experience and the, uh, uh, that, that resonated with me that I wasn't expecting to hook into as much as I did. And sorry, that might be incredibly boring, but I think that, that I guess the surprise to me was how uh, not alien it was. It was a bunch of families who loved the game and loved their kids and were trying to provide a, a safe place for their kids to play a game that they loved. And then it went wherever it went. But fundamentally that's what it was about it was about a community that loved the game and was trying to figure out a way to to keep it going and the one thing that that i would add you know is kind of concluding is we knew this going in but it's been reaffirmed with the great feedback that we're getting the movie's called soccer town usa but it's really about soccer towns usa you know everybody should step up and make their argument, whether it's St. Louis, whether it's Portland, Seattle, Los Angeles, you know, Dallas. We want to see a country of soccer towns where the spread of this great game, you know, the community, the families, you know, uh, that, you know, can just keep building and, 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 you know, kicking the ball further down the road for sure. All right, to wrap up, uh, give us some promotion. I know, obviously, times are a little different and challenging, but uh, tell us about how people can uh, enjoy the film as I have already, and and, and do you have any plans to kind of uh, augment that or, or rekindle maybe what you were thinking about doing before 
sort of uh, offering it out there on, on YouTube, et cetera. And frankly, last question, if, do you have any other projects maybe that might have emanated out of this that you think could also get the documentary treatment? Uh, I think I will, the first thing, we'll talk, yeah, why don't you jump in? No, no, I was going to defer to the to, to the Hollywood uh, you know, right, so, uh, TV film guy who knows what he's talking about. So, okay, so on, on, on the first thing, we, you know, we, we finished a cut of the film uh, and, and we were targeting the Kicking and Screening Film Festival in New York last, uh, last June because it was a film festival that Tom and I had gone to the year before to be inspired, to get the film done. And, uh, and it just felt like we wanted to premiere there. It's just, it's, it's good soccer people. It's a good crowd. And we just, that was kind of our target was to, to, to show it for the first time there, which we did. And it went over very well. And then the app after that, the plan was to hit some other festivals, take it around and then look for some sort of distribution, um, which would involve, uh, Clear, you know, getting rights things resolved and doing a new cut and getting a real narrator, not me temping my voice in at 11 o'clock one night when we had to rewrite some stuff at the last minute. And then as everything in the world kind of came to a halt, we just realized that there were no festivals that we we're going to be going to this year. Uh, the, the whole distribution plan was going to be delayed indefinitely. And we were sitting on a movie that we really liked and we felt that it was a story that people would like to watch. And rather than, so we, we sort of did the mental calculation and said, at best, we have this thing up on Netflix or iTunes or something in 2021. And that just feels really far away. And it feels like a good time to share stories and put stuff out for people to enjoy and maybe be distracted by in a good way and have something else to talk about for a few minutes. And so we put it up on YouTube for free um, and, and used our festival cut for that. And so the plan right now is let it be there, let people enjoy it. Uh, it's soccer town USA on YouTube. There's no fancy website. It's just that. And uh, if at some point uh, we can go, take it around and, and do screenings, we'd be happy to do that. Um, but that's it for right now. So it's, it's there on YouTube and it's free and we've, we've made it as, as easy as possible for people uh, to maybe forget about what's going on in the world for an hour and eight minutes and, and think about soccer. And releasing it out into the world, you know, which I call uh, our gift to the American soccer community uh, has been quite a relief. You know, we knew this was a good story, well told, and we wanted to share it. So we've done that. Uh, so for me, the historian, uh, I'm back in the 19th century trying to write a book on the oldest FA outside of Britain, which is the American Football Association formed in Newark in 1884, uh, just proving once again that we have as long a history uh, as anyone else. But we are storytellers. I normally do it through the written word. Kirk does as well, but it gets on to uh, the television screen. Uh, but we're both, you know, in love with the game of soccer and there are more stories to tell. So maybe I'll leave uh, a little suspense. I would love uh, to tell another soccer story with Kirk because, you know, it, one of the great things about this and, and Kirk uh, referenced it uh Many years after we studied together and played together, you know, a guy from New Jersey, a guy from L.A., you know, got together, you know, on this project. And, and it's just, you know, rekindled and, and cultivated that friendship. So I'll forever be grateful uh, for Soccer Town, you know, coming in to do that. But uh, there are still more stories to be told. And that's it. I think that's it. We're, we're friends and we were teammates and we collaborated well on this. And so there have been some other soccer stories we've talked about wanting to dig in and do and uh, uh, having, you know, you always, you always learn something new on every project and on every production. I've been on countless TV shows and uh, uh, there's always a new, there's always a new thing that you learn anywhere. But I think that we certainly learned a lot from the process of doing this documentary together. And uh, I think it would be fun to dive in and maybe not make all the same mistakes again and, and take another crack at something. Well, guys, have, have at our um, 
our 160 some odd episodes, there might be a couple of soccer stories buried in there too. You never, you never know what might inspire. Got to go through your archives. God forbid, uh, guys. Well, it's actually, by the way, it's funny. You, I'm sorry, really quick. It's it's funny you mentioned uh, St. Louis because we we showed a, a cut to Bob Bradley because you always want to make your old coach happy, and he showed it to one of uh, the other guys on staff at at LAFC, a former national team player. Uh, named Mike Sorber, and he watched it and and called and said, I love this. We need a movie like this for St. Louis. And I said, yes, I'm sure there would be a great one and someone else is going to do that one. But um, yes, there are plenty more stories out there to tell and uh, and maybe we'll grab one of them. Right. That was uh, tremendous. I love that conversation. I could have gone another couple hours with the boys, but um, they have lives to get back to. And uh, uh, frankly, so do I. And fr- I certainly know that you do, too. Uh, but uh, this movie, if you haven't seen it, uh, you uh, drop what you're doing. Uh, fire up the YouTube and uh, for free, you will enjoy this movie called Soccer Town USA. Uh, cast it to your big screen. Do whatever you want. But it's it's. Of high quality, it is absolutely a, a theatrical uh, quality feature, and um, you will enjoy it. You don't need to be a soccer fan to enjoy it. Uh, and even if you're a soccer geek like me, you will find uh, footage in there that you've never seen before. Uh, so it's a it's a treasure trove for that kind of stuff too. Uh, and it's uh, it's just it's fantastic. It's very well done, and uh, you will enjoy it. And uh, I I don't recommend that you watch it. I mandate that you go and uh, and watch it and uh, it's only an hour plus and uh, it's free for God's sake. So it's not going to cost you anything to enjoy it. And uh, why not enjoy it? And you can also follow along uh, on Twitter uh, about what uh, further promotion and or screenings and other things that might be going on related to this film. Uh, follow the boys at soccer town underscore USA at soccer town underscore USA. Pretty easy to do. We wish the boys the best with this film and maybe perhaps some other projects uh, down the road. Lots of uh, lots of soccer history that's uh, been uh, unearthed from this film, and uh, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it, and I and I know that you will as well. Uh, let's see. Before we run, we want to say thank you not only to you listeners, and please and in, uh, indeed keep safe and healthy. We, we've said it before; we'll keep saying it. Uh, we hope we uh, provide a little bit of respite from the. Uh, uh, the world's woes and uh, perhaps your own uh, personal ones as well. Uh, all our first responders and our, our medical professionals and our other essential workers out there, and you know who you are. Uh, we uh, tip our, our cap to you and um, we appreciate your doing what you're doing. And we also appreciate, frankly, all the folks out there that uh, are hopefully supporting you by keeping that curve uh, suppressed. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully emerge from this stronger and better uh, in the months and, frankly, years to come. Uh, and God forbid, we'll actually get to see some professional soccer and other sports, for God's sakes, uh, not only on television, but in person. But um, we want to thank, of course, our pal Jerry Payne in the metro Atlanta area uh, for all his yeoman-like work, of course, for editing and putting all of our pieces together. Thank you, kind sir, for doing that. And um, yeah, we are going to leave you, of course, with a song. We don't want to disappoint you. And uh, this uh, song that we're going to leave you with... <laughs> We've really dug deep. Uh, you may have heard a little snippet in the... Uh, uh, well, actually, you will have heard a snippet if you've seen the movie. I don't think you'll have heard the snippet yet uh, in this in this episode. But when the U.S. national team qualified for the 1990 World Cup, the first time in 40 years at that time, uh, and you heard it alluded to before, 1989 was that sort of proverbial shot heard round the world while Caligiuri uh, knocking that uh, that goal in at Trinidad and Tobago and, and sealing the qualification of the United States after a long drought in the World Cup. Well, huh, that didn't stop uh, the folks at MCA Records and Azoff Entertainment, Irving Azoff in particular, uh, from, <laughs> from writing and crafting a song by Def Jeff and DJ Eric Vaughn. And uh, it features the entire U.S. national team World Cup team from 1990. Uh, And here's the song that they did. It was a music video and everything. If you remember it, God bless you. If you never heard of it, oh boy, you're in for a treat. Here it is. It's called Victory. Unfortunately, no victories were to be had in 1990 in the World Cup tournament. But uh, the boys, 
uh, Messrs. Harks, Miola, and Ramos, as well as all the other players, you'll hear their voices in this clip, this video, or this song. It's called Victory. Here it is. Def Jeff, DJ Eric Vaughn, and the entire 1990 U.S. World Cup soccer team. Enjoy it, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, everyone. The USA has realized the dream. They will qualify for the World Cup in 1990. Togetherness and unity means victory for you and me with dedication, heart and soul. You have the tools to achieve your goals in a battle. I never lose because I'm a champion. I march on till victory is won. Reaching higher, striving harder, always doing better because it's a part of the winning spirit. You got to keep your chin up and we'll be coming home with the World Cup. So put your best foot forward. Together, let's step. But make sure momentum is kept. Togetherness. And unity means victory for you and me with intellect and self-respect. Attain whatever you want to get. Togetherness and unity means victory in Italy with dedication, heart and soul. You have the tools to achieve your goals. When I was young, my folks would demand, work hard for what you want and be the best you can. Stay out of trouble, get an education. If you do, you gain admiration. Respect yourself as well as others. Love your sisters and love your brothers. Stay off drugs, keep your mind clear so you can see when victory is near. Togetherness and unity means victory for you and me with intellect. And self-respect, attain whatever you want to get. Togetherness and unity means victory. In Italy, with dedication, heart and soul, you have the tools to achieve your goal. For the first time in 40 years, we're here. The object is clear and victory is near. Yeah, it's in the air. Can't you tell? It is such a sweet, sweet smell. The USA, we're going all the way. We didn't come to fool around. We're here to play. So let's get busy and let's work together. Results for a strong endeavor. It took us one score, plus one more. Now the U.S. is knocking at the door. It took us a while, but we're here, so what's up? We plan to go home with the World Cup. We practiced hard, made our bodies work and jerk. Now we're ready to go berserk. So if you're looking, you know where to find me. I'm picking up my cup at the Italian 90. Kicking the ball against the wall of the mall. Ever since I was small. I had dreams of being on a team, and now that I'm here, you know it doesn't seem like such a long time ago, but right now, I came to show up. A champ is made up, I ain't afraid of you or your crew, so what you want to do? Togetherness and unity means victory for you and me with intellect and self-respect. Attain whatever you want to get. Togetherness and unity means victory in Italy with dedication. Heart and soul, you have the tools to achieve your goal.